Good evening. We want to start with something different tonight. A roll call of sorts, a sea of faces, beautiful kids, survivors. They're typical kids, freckles, glasses, braces, even some bashful smiles as they reel off the names of prescription drugs they shouldn't be able to pronounce. As you both know, we have been working for a year on this investigation at ABC News. The use of heavy-duty psychotropic drugs given to America's foster children. As a new governmental report says, sometimes even infants. And of course, these are children already traumatized by abuse, neglect, and abandonment who tell us what they most want is an adult who will love them and take their hand for life. We want to say at the outset, sometimes drugs can be useful, but should this be the first response? And what about the sheer quantity of pills the children are being given, often without the therapy they say they crave? Here's the question. Is there something else we owe these children who have already endured so much? My name is Roger Jr. I am nine years old. When I was moving from home to home, I felt sad because no one would keep me or love me. I were in 28 homes. Somehow we keep marching on. I used to like sneak some dog food and stuff, and I'd eat out of the garbage sometimes because I was like really hungry. Somehow we'll keep moving on. I had huge bruises and welts and scars from the beatings that I got. My name is Brooke and I'm seven. These are the meds that I've been taking since I was four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I was on Depakote, Seroquel. And some other ones I cannot name off the top of my head right now. Uh, some of them for, were for ADHD. I am not ADHD. I'm just naughty. One was for being bipolar. I am not bipolar at all. I was four whenever I started taking meds. Seroquel, XR, Adderall. Lexapro. This one is Shotera. Respiral. The last one is Abilify. They made me feel as if I had a thousand bricks on my head. I was prescribed seven or eight different pills. I gained almost or over a hundred pounds. Just mixing all the medications together, just I was just a zombie. My name is Crystal, I'm 15. I have been in 26 placements. I feel like I have almost disappeared from everybody's point of view. I was put on three different medicines when I first went into foster care at age of six. Ever since then, they've just been piling up more medicine. The reason why I was that was so, so like always mad and upset all the time was because I didn't really have anybody to talk to. I told my adoptive mom and dad that I went off these meds. They don't make me feel right. You feel like the meds are taking over your whole body. Now that I don't take these pills, I feel free. Since I'm not taking any more medication, I feel as if I am in control of myself and no one else is. I'm doing very well. I got the honor three times in a row. It is not right. You people that are over-medicating the, the children, you should stop it right now. What I really want people to know is that you can make it through the process as I have. Even though you're in foster care, you should never give up and always have hope. And when we come back, some astonishing stories of children taking multiple drugs and how their lives change when they get a different kind of help. If you look at little Brooke today, it's impossible to imagine that this was Brooke before. A seven-year-old child, just 43 pounds, given five mind-altering psychotropic drugs prescribed for serious mental disorders. Brooke, we need to get down. 
To deal with her eruptions of anger, her foster parents were told to take her to a mental health clinic, where their solution was medication, including Seroquel, which is often used for schizophrenia. And they added Seroquel. Within a few weeks, they decided that it wasn't working, they needed to do something else. At this point, she's getting worse. She's not getting any better. And then she was given more medication and more. Ten drug changes in just four months. Frequently, the clinic increased the doses. Brooke's older sister, Kayla, watched in anguish. I don't know how they could possibly help children if all they do is just give the children meds and it, it makes the children feel out of place. But her foster mother, Lisa, felt she had no choice, worried the state would take the children away if she didn't give the medication. We were told to put our faith in the system, and that's what we did. They kept saying she needs more medications. That's how sad it is. The meds make us think. Tantrums are good. It gets your anger out. But no, it doesn't. More sadness for two girls who had already been dealt a hand from hell taken from a mother who had a long record of drug dealing and prostitution and uprooted again and again. As Little Brooke's drug doses and wild behavior increase, Lisa decides to record the rages. And this could have gone on year after year if Lisa hadn't decided to pay for a private outside doctor, psychiatrist Dr. Louis Quinones, who was stunned by the pills Brooke was taking. The first thing we got to think about is the medicine causing this. There always has to be a high index of suspicion when we're using these agents. Brooke is now being weaned off all her medication. What are you feeling right now? Good. Do you feel it anywhere special or? My heart. My tummy. And my legs. Do you have a refrigerator? Uh, yes, we do. Brooke still has a lot of demons left to wrestle from the life she's lived, but she's learning to heal one day at a time. What's another choice over a tantrum? What's a good choice? Hug you. What do you do? What are you doing right now? No, what do you do? Yeah, you hug all the anger out, right? Dear God, I want to be a vet now, please. And a firefighter. When a doctor tells me that the drug is working, I would ask, who's it working for? Is it working for the caretaker? Is it working for the system? It only matters to me whether it's working for the kid. Michael Perino, who runs one of the biggest advocacy organizations in the country for foster kids, says, too often, the first reaction to any problem with the child is a drug. But when we read that foster kids are medicated up to 13 times yeah. more than other kids, is it because they're, they are a more troubled population? They are troubled. If you've been hurt the way these kids are, you or I would feel the same way. We would be angry. We would be upset. We would act out. The answer isn't to always try to change their brain chemistry. And it's known that many of these drugs have serious side effects, tremors, irreversible tics, and weight gain leading to diabetes. Not to mention the stories the children tell us of feeling they're in a kind of chemical prison. Take a look at a little boy named Keontae. Those are his screams behind the bedroom door. Like so many other foster children, Keontae had already suffered. His mother's neglect. At four, he was left alone to take care of his little sister. And after that, he says, he was abused, beaten. When he arrived at the home of Scott and Carol Cook, they discovered he had been given 12 different drugs in foster care. Not only Seroquel, since he was six years old, but the antidepressant Lexapro and Depakote for mood stabilization. He came straight from the hospital to us. Um, we gave him his meds that night, and 4 a.m. in the morning, I get up, and he's walking fast in circle in his bedroom, around and around and around. It just made me feel wild and weird. Uh, some of them were for ADHD. I'm not ADHD. I'm just naughty. <laughs> this is Chianti at 10 years old trying to come off all the medication. Is it hard to watch that? Sort of. That once was me. It felt great. He paid for that one kid, that kid. He was just hurt, and he needed the right attention and, to be honest, the right therapy.
can the states afford to pay for the can therapy? They, can they afford not to? Can they afford to have kids who are on all these medications? What's the future going to be for them? These young people have a right to be safe and well cared for. That's the promise the state makes when it takes them out of their homes. And that promise is too often not met. And today, life is very different for Chiante. Off all the medications, in therapy, he's in some honors classes, and he now has a permanent family to help him heal. He's been adopted. Scott and Carol Cook celebrated with a party. Now you're part of the family. And no, no getting out of it. And remember little Brooke? She too has something to heal the broken places. Brooke and her sister Kayla have also been adopted. Here they are with Lisa, Dad, and all their new brothers. And for every child whose life has changed, there is another child asking for help. And as we spent this past year investigating, we kept wondering, why is this happening? What about the doctors giving out the medications? It's been a team effort, and Sharon Alfonsi picks up now. We decided to track those doctors down to hear what they had to say. We'll show you what happens when we confront them when we come back. Powerful psychotropics, some not approved for use in young children. Others warn they could raise the risk of suicidal tendencies. And yet... Every day, they are doled out to tens of thousands of foster care kids across America, even infants. I give them to a three-year-old. A three-year-old, yeah. We spent a year tracking down some of the doctors who prescribe these drugs to foster care children. Give a minute to talk to us. Florida Dr. Sahel Punjwani is one of the true believers in these medications for kids. He was the doctor assigned to treat seven-year-old Gabriel Myers. Gabriel's father was in jail. His mother addicted to prescription drugs. One day, she passed out in a Denny's parking lot with the engine running, six-year-old Gabriel in the car. When Florida police found them hours later, they took her to jail, and Gabriel was placed in foster care. During the next months, Gabriel was moved from home to home, therapist to therapist. He started acting out and trashing his room. Dr. Sohail Punjwani became Gabriel's psychiatrist, paid for by the state of Florida. Seven times Gabriel was driven to Dr. Punjwani's office and often leaving with a changing mix of prescriptions for powerful psychotropic drugs. One prescription even set off alarms at Walgreens Pharmacy, which sent this message to Dr. Punjwani, wanting to know whether Gabriel would be safe taking the drug. Gabriel's behavior got worse. Then, one afternoon, he did the unimaginable. The seven-year-old locked himself in the bathroom of his foster home, screaming, I deserve to die, stood on the edge of the tub, and hung himself with a shower hose. What would drive a seven-year-old to hang himself? Police detective Ephraim Suarez's investigation looked at his traumatic past, his treatment, and then turned to the drugs prescribed to him over time by Dr. Punjwani. This is one for Lexapro. They use a Symbiax. There were a lot of questions as to why the medications were adjusted and changed so frequently. Gabriel's death was ruled an accident, but police, the medical examiner, and FBI all point to the possibility the medications he was taking may have contributed to his deadly act. I'm Sharon Alfonso with ABC News. Do you have a minute to talk to us about Gabriel Myers? So we tracked down Dr. Punjwani outside his office. The drugs that you prescribed to him were off-label, and they were black box warnings that say that they could cause suicidal tendencies. Sad stories happen, but that does not mean that everything is uh, so the doctor is responsible for it because we are in the business of taking care of these children. That's all I have his, to say. But how much time did he actually spend with Gabriel? His foster father said you only spent about five minutes with him before you prescribed these drugs. That is untrue. How much time did you spend with well, him? Well, I don't have the record right now. Later, Dr. Punjwani admitted it is possible he only spent five minutes with Gabriel while adjusting his meds. Five minutes. Florida has since kicked him out of the Medicaid program. Turns out Dr. Punjwani has been arrested for cocaine possession. To avoid prosecution, he agreed to go through a court-mandated rehab program. But across the country, doctors continue to treat foster care children with powerful mixes of psychotropic drugs. 
Often, the drugs are helpful in treatment, but is enough care being taken with foster children? As we've said, foster kids are up to 13 times more likely to be treated with psychotropic drugs than other children. And a government report that came out this week found that hundreds of these children are on five or more of these powerful drugs at the same time. And is anyone looking out for them? No. And if you try to speak out and say anything about it, you're basically told to, to shut up. This social worker has worked with hundreds of foster children. She asked we protect her identity. Why do you think they're medicating these children? <clears throat> it's much easier to medicate a child than it is to pay $200 an hour to a therapist to talk through their problems with them. Whistleblowers describe an unholy convergence between doctors who prescribe the drugs, Medicaid, which is willing to pay for them, and drug companies that make billions from them. You know, how did antipsychotics, drugs supposedly used for people who have lost touch with reality, how did they develop such a wide market? Neuropsychiatrist uh, you know, Dr. Stefan Kruszewski says drug companies have specifically targeted the doctors who treat children. A senior representative from Pfizer took me for lunch and they started to say, let me tell you about Geodon. And I'm listening to them talk to me about children. I was already well aware that it hadn't been approved for any children. Khrushchevsky was a key whistleblower in lawsuits against the drug companies. In all, four drug makers have paid a total of more than $2 billion to settle claims they illegally marketed antipsychotics to children. All deny any wrongdoing. Barbie has a flat screen TV? Yeah. Judith first came to Rob and Andre Schlischer from foster care. She was five years old and already diagnosed with bipolar disorder. There was no light in her face. Blank face, blank stares, you know, not a typical child. She was on a combination of powerful psychotropics. What did the medicine make you feel like? Sleepy in the day. And almost comatose at night. So that once when Judith got sick and vomited all over the bed, she didn't even wake up. After that, I said, call the doctor. Mm -hmm. I said, because I'm done with the sleeping medicine. I'm Sharon Alfonsi. Uh, it was Dr. Edgardo Concepcion who first prescribed an antipsychotic to Judith. Do they work on children? It works. They become more calm. They become more compliant. I give them to a three-year-old. A three-year-old? Yeah. Is a mother of a young child at home, I think, you know, all yeah. three-year-olds act crazy. Not when... When a three-year-old starts hitting themselves on the head, not when a child of three is looking for a knife to uh, stab somebody. Could be the younger sibling or, or the parent. Medicaid here. records reveal Dr. Concepcion's office is one of the leading prescribers of antipsychotics to Medicaid kids under the age of five in the entire state of Louisiana. Judith eventually came under the care of Dr. Charles Zena of Tulane University. When we pulled the Medicaid data on the prescriber for Judith, he had written 2,700 prescriptions for antipsychotics in the last year. 2,700? Is it's that an a extraordinary number. Extraordinary. But this is not just children, these are adults. I have a big practice, and I have people that work under me who are also writing prescriptions. Is it possible that you're writing too many prescriptions for these drugs to too many kids? I don't think so. You don't? Yeah. So how is Judith? Dr. Zena took a different approach with Judith, weaning her off most of her meds. Today, she is a happy, healthy little girl. Hello, how are you doing? Her champions, Rob and Andre, have adopted her, giving her what every foster care child desperately needs, a loving family. I love you very much a lot. I love you. But a reality check. This is a loving family for one little girl, but only about one out of ten kids in foster care get adopted. So many other children are still being overprescribed, Diane. And as you know, we tried to take our questions also to the U.S. government, only to find agencies referring us each to each other. The Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services declined our request for an interview. But they did send a letter asking states to come up with their own plans by June 2012. And we sat down with Robert Nelson of the Food and Drug Administration, which regulates drugs in this country, to ask him who's going to lead the charge.
Is it time to issue a wake-up call about the use of these drugs in children? I'd be curious to hear what you think a wake-up call would be and what, what that might look like. You're the FDA. I know this is an issue that, that has been discussed, and obviously uh, we're well aware of it. Uh, You're sitting at home at night alone? Which agency do you blame? <laughs> well, um, I think we all have to take responsibility, but we all need to work together to solve the problem. And that's exactly what Senator Tom Carper is doing just yesterday, holding a congressional hearing, asking tough questions about the medicines given to foster children. No children in this country should be taking at the same time five different uh, kinds of psychotropic drugs. And he called witnesses, one of whom you've met before. Remember little Keontae? The meds made my appetite go away. Like I was shaking during while I was speaking. You were? Yeah, I was like... Mm. So maybe one piece of advice you have for, for all of us. That meds aren't going to help a child with their problems. What I learned in therapy is that you talk about the deepest thing, it hurts, but you can handle it better. When we come back... I want someone to call mom and dad, because I've never had that. How foster care can work when love, therapy, and a little monster spray are added into the mix. Next. For all of the times we start, for all of the things I'm not. Can I have a hug? Welcome to A Reason to Hope. Good morning, ladies. Time to get up. The Mary Hurst Residential Treatment Center in Kentucky where they take children who've endured some of the worst abuse anywhere in the state and surround them with a team. A psychiatrist, therapist, workers nearby to talk, laugh, and help. No! I don't care! Even though 75% of the kids who come to them are on psychotropic drugs, when they leave, nearly three quarters are on reduced or no medication at all. We caught up with a little dancer, seven-year-old Jeremiah, his eight-year-old brother, DJ. Michael Jackson's Billie Jean never looked so good. They were taken away from their mother amid allegations of extreme neglect. No doctors, rarely going to school, frequently going hungry. Their stepdad had a rap sheet including a conviction for manufacturing methamphetamine. And their mother slept through a fire which nearly killed them. I'm blue. Can I play too? Yeah. Their therapist, David Crowley, asks about that fire. Your mom wouldn't wake up and the house was on fire. What was that like? It was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it got all over mom's yeah. bed. Her got little burns all over her. Today, Jeremiah is getting dental care for the teeth that still show the evidence of all that neglect. And his brother, DJ, says they've learned something wonderful about food. Good food. What's healthy? Corn, green beans, mm. broccoli. Mm. My favorite movie is Grease. Ready? Harry Hurst searches for more intuitive, creative ways to deal with the demons that haunt these children. As children like Jeremiah are weaned off drugs, they are armed with something formidable monster spray to back down the terrors. We have to spray where our bedroom is. Mm -hmm. If you're wondering, monster spray is water mixed with food coloring. Because this is really post-traumatic stress. It's right. classic, isn't it? Yeah, it's textbook PTSD. Because it would be hard for some adults to cope with those things, much less a seven and eight year old. Who do you turn into at night, Jeremiah? Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Who's stronger, Spider-Man okay, or well, Superman? Jesus is. Jesus is stronger than either one of them. It's me happy in my bed. And there's an irony. David, the therapist, helping wean Jeremiah off drugs. And where did you used to work? I used to work with a, a big pharma company talking with doctors about medications well how'd you get here i got here because this is i think where my heart is are you me 
you know? Do you know what I do know? Is your name Sarah? In another part no. of the treatment center, another no. child of suffering, Sarah, now in her 19th foster care placement in just six years. Sarah says her mother was drug addicted and she was three years old when she was abandoned. At the time, I didn't know how to take a bath. I didn't know how to take care of myself. I didn't know how to brush my teeth. I thought it was supposed to be for hair, so I started brushing my hair with my toothbrush. And when no one was looking, I'd like pick some dog food and eat it. Sometimes, Sarah cuts herself. Do you still do it? Do you still find yeah, it? The other day I did. You did? Yeah. But it's going yeah. away. What are you thinking when you do that? I just want to die. Through the years, she too has been put on powerful medications. Now, only on Seroquel, and with therapy, getting better, beginning to heal. Though she knows at the age of 15, she has little chance of being adopted. It doesn't mean she doesn't have dreams like so many other little girls who have big crushes on Justin Bieber. So what is it about him? He doesn't seem like the type of guy who would hurt or beat on his girlfriend. I have a lot in common with him. His favorite candy is Sour Patch Kids, and I love Sour Patch Kids. His favorite color is purple, and I love purple. He loves spaghetti and meatballs, and I love spaghetti and meatballs. And everywhere at Maryhurst, you see transformations. One side effect of antipsychotics can be enormous weight gain. Gabby, who left Maryhurst in 2009, off the medications now, lost nearly 100 pounds. What do you think saved your life? Being here, they showed that they cared about me a lot. Deb coat. 15-year-old Crystal hopes that can happen to her, too. She has been on a dozen medications and in 27 different placements over eight years. My weight is sitting at 300 right now. Most sports activities I want to do, I can't do because I'm overweight. Step team, can't do that because I can't bend down and clap underneath my legs. My feelings get hurt easily when people make fun of me like that. May I ask some stuff about your life? Sure. Like, have you ever been in foster care? I have not been in foster care. And I, I think that, that you are so strong. Just Judy Lambeth is president paper. and CEO of Mary Hurst where the motto is, we love you until you learn to love yourself. We carry the hope until you find it. That's the greatest thing about being here. It's hope. Hope for the miracle of a family to love you permanently. Almost six years ago, when we did our first story on foster care. Tonight, we are calling all angels, and we hope by the A family the was watching. We watched your special, and I called the next day. So and guess know. what? Laura and John Wade started taking in foster kids, and this summer took in a family that included a little dancer named Jeremiah. They joined the effort to reduce his medications and decided something else, that Jeremiah and his siblings belong with them. Jeremiah, what is today? Today is adoption day. We're going to get adopted. Did you sleep okay? Yeah. How's that? I didn't have a No bad dreams. I didn't either. <laughs> Order in the court. What lucky families you are. Out of the whole world, you found each other and you picked each other. <laughs> and so a little boy armed with a lot of vitality gets ready to go to bed. Armed with his superheroes and his monster spray. Where do you spray your monster spray? Under my bed. That'll take care of them for sure. Wow. One, two, three, four, Spider-Man. And something just as magical and powerful. Well, good night. Sleep well. Good night, good night prayer with a forever mom. Tonight, watch over the night of Jeremiah not to have bad dreams. Just name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you would like to bring a little magic spray of your own to some of these incredibly brave and resilient foster children and to places like Maryhurst, which could sure use some financial help, go to our website at abcnews.com slash 20.